Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week, and this week's pick of the week... Mythologies and Apocrypha, issue number one from Fantagraphics. Now, this is written and illustrated by Tim Lane. I know that some of you may not be familiar with who this dude is. I became familiar with him a few years ago through some of his work at Fantagraphics. He had done this book, I think it was called Happy Hour in America. He likes to take pop culture icons and Americana and kind of blend them together in a really interesting kind of method of storytelling, right? So this is about Frank Sinatra, it's about Steve McQueen, and it's about a movie that they did together, but it blends fact and it blends fiction all together to make this really interesting exploration on American culture through the lens of these fictionalized, if not mytholo mythologized, uh, American icons like Frank Sinatra, like Steve McQueen, like Elvis, like Sammy Davis Jr., Johnny Cash. If you want to see a scene of Johnny Cash and... Uh, Steve McQueen and Sammy Davis Jr., maybe a few others, like, on a set on Mars, having, like, a quick draw, like, check this one out, but what really anchors it is the artwork. The artwork is absolutely brilliant. All of the likenesses are spot on. The dialogue, the hand lettering, everything about it is top-notch craft. Really, really solid artwork. An interesting story, because this is just kind of how he approaches story, I would recommend you checking out things like there's a book called Toy Box Americana. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with that one, Happy Hour in America. But this book is awesome. And it's got like fake ads in it and interesting things being done throughout with with the pen, with the line work, with color, with, with fake advertisements, with extra little stories in the background. Just a really great meticulously crafted comic book from Fantagraphics and it makes the pick of the week. So Mythologies and Apocrypha, issue number one from Tim Lane. That's your pick of the week. Let's jump over to Marvel. We've got Star Wars, Darth Maul, Black, White, and Red, issue number one. This is the start of a new anthology series formatted in black and white and red stories all about Darth Maul. Now, usually these things have like three or four stories in them. This just has one, right? And it's decent. It's all right, right? It's a self-contained story. I guess each issue, instead of having a few short stories, will have one full-size comic story. I mean, that's cool. I like the character of Darth Maul, but this story was just a little boring. It wasn't really exciting. The artwork was cool. It had some really cool instances of color. It's got some cool concepts. It's basically like a ghost ship out there in space that uh, Darth Sidious like sends Darth Maul to go check out. And it's interesting enough, but for the most part, it didn't really do it. But there's a Frank Miller Darth Maul cover. Now, when Frank Miller did the Blade cover, I was like, there's no way in my life did I ever think that Frank Miller would do a Blade cover. Well, I thought that was definitely more likely than him doing a Darth Maul cover. I love Darth Maul. I love the design. I'm a big fan of Frank Miller. I'm going to give this cover of the week just because I'm just very thankful that Frank Miller did a Darth Maul cover. Do you think Frank Miller even knows who Darth Maul is? Do you think Frank Miller's a Star Wars fan? It's an interesting question. Answer in the comments. But I love that. So I'm going with the cover of the week there. We got Ultimate Spider-Man issue number four from Jonathan Hickman, Marvel Comics, with a guest artist on this issue. And the guest artist is, as soon as I find the credits, David Messina. And it's, I, this is kind of a disappointing issue of Ultimate Spider-Man for me. Like, it's good. The dialogue is okay. But this whole issue is a dinner date between Harry Osborn and his wife, who is someone familiar to us. Um, shouldn't be hard to figure that out, especially since I just showed you those pages. But it's like a it's like a double date with Peter and MJ and Harry and his wife, and they're just talking about stuff. It does move certain elements of the story forward, but it doesn't have any excitement, doesn't have any action, doesn't have anything that we have come to love about Ultimate Spider-Man. I'm not saying it's a bad issue. The art is not as good as what we get from Marco Cicchetto. It's not dynamic, but that's part of the story. It is literally just four people 
at dinner talking with a little bit of cutscenes going back to Uncle Ben and what he's doing. So it does move certain things forward a little bit. But I think a lot of people are going to be a little bit let down here. Maybe that's part of the structure, though. Maybe Hickman knew that Chichetto was going to need a break after three issues, so he put this issue in there so that he could have something a little bit more static, a little bit more low-key to anticipate the return of Chichetto. Hopefully next issue, I have to double-check the solicitations, but... I was slightly disappointed in this issue of Ultimate Spider-Man. But we also got Ultimate Universe in a second print, which is odd to have a second print for a book that came out months ago, but with all of the popularity of the Ultimate titles, and this not being reprinted in the Ultimate Invasion trade paperback, it's a much needed reprint, so you can find this at your stores right now. This is what takes place between Ultimate Invasion and all of the Ultimate books that are going on right now. Ultimate X-Men, Ultimate Black Panther, and Ultimate Spider-Man. So there you go. Speaking of Jonathan Hickman, we've got the penultimate issue of Gods. Gods, issue number seven here. And it kind of wraps up one of these characters' stories. But now that there's only one issue left... I don't understand what the point or the mission statement of this series is. Initially, they said it's Hickman redefining the cosmology of the Marvel Universe. I guess there's been some elements of it there. I mean, obviously, the things about the powers that be and the natural order of things, but each issue's kind of been self-contained, part of a larger narrative, but it's hard to kind of piece it together. I just don't... I'm having trouble finding this book's mission statement. So I'm not saying that Hickman and company don't know what they're doing. I'm just saying that I don't know what they're doing. Introducing new concepts and new ideas, but what's the scope? What's the scale? What's the payoff? I guess we'll find out in the next issue. It was a good self-done, one-and-done, self-contained kind of story that it... it there's been a lot of setup and a lot of just... I, I don't know. I've been slightly kind of just not getting this book if that makes sense daredevil is here with number eight we got a frank miller cover on that i think that's awesome but i don't think this book is awesome it is daredevil number eight legacy number 670 it is an oversized ten dollar issue for no reason well they'll tell you the issue or the reason is what the 60th anniversary of daredevil okay so right in the middle of this run you're gonna give us a giant ten dollar issue that nobody asked for that we know we're just moments away from a 675 or even a number 12 or whatever the hell they want to do. I'm tired of it. I'm done. I'm over it. I'm, I marvel you suck when you do stuff like this. There is a main story in here, but Salad and Ahmed with Aaron Cooter on the artwork. And it's I. It's cool. I guess it's like Electra Daredevil teaming up with Daredevil Daredevil. And they're doing their thing. And Bullseye's in it. And Bullseye, what he's doing is actually really effing stupid it's really stupid and it's so against the grain of that character and who that character is and it's just dumb it's like you know how we always you know not we but some people say we're tired of them changing these characters to fit the story that the writer wants to tell or something that's exactly what's going on with bullseye here and it's crap there's a bunch of backup stories anna senti uh dd chichester or dg uh chichester Elsa Sunjunsen, Erica Schultz. I didn't read any of them. I didn't read any of them because this annoyed the hell out of me. This book sucked. Great cover, though. I'm done with Daredevil. Blade is here with issue number 10. This is the final issue for Blade because at Marvel, if it's working, stop it. <laughs> like, I don't understand. Um, Blade has been a really good book. Um, and this was actually kind of an abrupt ending to these last nine issues. Honestly, I almost feel like this book wasn't supposed to end at issue number 10. It's been critically sound. It's been decent enough in sales. I know that they're relaunching Brian Hill, who's done a great job with this book. He is doing like a Blade Midnight Suns book as part of Blood Hunt. I know that, so maybe some of these threads will carry through. But this was a rather abrupt ending that makes me feel like this was not a planned ending. It just kind of builds up, builds up, builds up, and it's over. And not in a good way. Not in like a Coen Brothers, Warren Ellis kind of way, but in a kind of, oh, y'all really just pulled the plug on this book, right? Because at Marvel, if it ain't broke, stop it, end it, cancel it, reboot it, relaunch it. Rah! 
Night Thrasher is here with issue number three. The penultimate issue of Night Thrasher, because this is only a four-issue series, must be trying to keep the trademark alive or something. I'm a huge Night Thrasher fan. I'm on this book just because I'm a huge Night Thrasher fan. Dwayne's one of my favorite characters. I'm glad he's back. I'm glad he's back in New York doing his thing. But man, they are pussyfooting around it. Like, just let him go out there and be Night Thrasher. This whole issue is him, like reflecting on the events of the last few days and this and that and it's really boring and it's dull and it's dumb and it sucks let's jump over to dc where we've got batman dark age issue number two loved this issue this is one of the most different and original alternate takes on the batman origin that i've ever read mark russell is doing what he does but he's doing it so well here right so he kind of likes to make these absurd moments in his comic scripts he kind of likes to balance satire and whimsy with like real drama and superheroics as well as comedy and he does it and he does it so freaking well this book kind of has a very classic vibe to it which is accentuated by the artwork from michael allred and laura allred on the colors I've been a Allred fan for decades at this point, and the art is absolutely gorgeous. But it's also just really intriguing. There have been so many alternate takes on Batman's origin or alternate takes on The Dark Knight. Um, things like Batman First Knight, which are fine and cool, but they lean a little heavy into familiarity. This book doesn't do that at all. Bruce is in Vietnam after being arrested. Um, he's being trained in Vietnam by Rachel Ghoul. Really interesting things. And it's taking this snot-nosed kid that we got to know in the first issue, and it's bringing him through a heroic journey. Here in issue number two, the uh, relationship between him and, him and Alfred is completely endearing. The colors are vibrant, and they are perfect, and they pop like no other. And the artwork, it's Mike Allred. Nuff said, it's Mike Allred. Nuff said. It's amazing. Batman Dark Age, that was dope. Then we've got Detective Comics 1084. We are nearing the end of the Rom V run, which I have really liked. Batman's been put through the ringer, and now he's up, uh, he's, he's on the other side of the tunnel, right? He's gone through the darkness. He's kind of redefined who he is as a person. He's made a lot of peace with elements within himself. And now he's out there to face this new Gotham that's been created in his absence. Um, I think that Rom V is building to the crescendo perfectly well here. We also got a backup story from Alex Pacnadel with his first work on Detective Comics, and it was a really great backup story about Shiva and Cassandra Kane. I really liked it. I liked how it reflected the main story. It's going to be sad to see Rom V leave this title, but the whole thing has been so masterfully crafted and structured to me, in my opinion, that I'm kind of glad. It's a story with a beginning and a middle and an end. And it'll be one complete thing to sit on bookshelves for years to come. Then we got The Flash here with issue number eight. Wally West has gone missing because of some crazy multi-dimensional type stuff. The speedster's probably causing all this stuff, all this extra-dimensional, timey-wimey, her, like crazy type stuff. Amanda Waller gets uh, a hold of this information, starts trying to turn the public against the Flashes. That part of the story is cool. The rest of this book is about Barry Allen trying to figure out what where Wally West is and step back into the role of the Flash. And it is confusing as hell. Now, I've said that Cy Spurrier's Flash has been a little bit challenging and I've enjoyed it for that. But this was one of those ones that I read and I'm just like, all right, that almost made no sense whatsoever. Like, you don't want to lose everybody by being too difficult to understand, right? Too uh, 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 esoteric in nature, but just, I don't know, Flash is working for me, but by issue eight, I thought that we'd be getting a little bit more clarity, and even when I think we got some more clarity, it gets weirder again. Then we got Green Arrow here with issue number 11, an interesting structure to issue number 11 where we kind of quickly wrap up from the cliffhanger from issue number 10 and then go right into the origin of Merlin and setting up the next phase here. Um, but I do like it. I really love the use of legacy, the use of the Arrow family, Connor, Roy, 
all the girls, everybody's involved here, but it's still very much an Oliver book and also a big focus in on Merlin here. And I love all the elements from like maybe even the TV show, maybe old school comics, and it all gets blends together, blended together to make a really fun cool Green Arrow book, and that's all you can ask for. The Penguin is here with issue number nine. I'm loving this Tom King series. It is a mean-spirited book about Penguin coming back to try to take power. Batman has been almost made to be supremely foolish um, in this book, and he's kind of fighting against that here in issue number nine. So I do like that element of the story, but Oswald's still a couple steps behind him. It makes Oswald a very menacing and threatening character, but then there's a reveal at the end. You're like, okay, there's a little bit more nuance to that. So all in all, I'm still loving the Penguin. Let's jump over to Image. And from Image, we have Drawing Blood, issue number one. This is written by Kevin Eastman, actually a story by Kevin Eastman and David Avalone, with a script by David Avalone, art by Ben Bishop. Now, this is a book that's actually been out before, um, and I remember reading it. I think it was released by IDW. I could be wrong on that. I wanted to say it was IDW, but I could be wrong. Apparently, they got the rights back or something, and they're re-releasing it as Image, or at Image. This is kind of like a fictional take on the story of Kevin Eastman. So it's about this cartoonist who created a worldwide media sensation along with a cartooning partner, and he sold his rights and somehow gets wrapped up in this organized crime kind of thing, right? He gets wrapped up. Basically, his former partner winds up dead, but he owes these gangsters a lot of money, and now they're coming after the dude who's based on Kevin Eastman, clearly, um... It's fun, though. I liked it. So they're coming after him, and he's like, what? I have nothing to do with this. Um, so I really like this book. I had a lot of fun revisiting it. Um, I knew that I had already read this before, but I wanted to read it again so I could talk about it here. A lot of people probably didn't check it out back in the day. I do think that it was like prestige format. Maybe there was more going on, but it's got humor. It's got action. It's got organized crime, and it's got a little bit of a route into a true story, but not really, right? So Drawing Blood, loved it. And I also love that Kevin Eastman cover right there. Then we've got Universal Monsters, Creature from the Black Lagoon Lives. The Dracula series was amazing. It was a story within the story for Dracula. Creature from the Black Lagoon uh, Lives is a sequel, right? But it's set in the modern day. It's about this woman. She has survived an attack, an uh, attempt on her life. She's dealing with trauma over that. She is hearing that there's a series of drownings happening in this Amazonian village. She goes down to inspect it. She thinks it's this murderer. She's dealing with all of this stuff. But it's the creature from the Black Lagoon. Maybe, or maybe it's all tied up. Very little actually happens here. A lot of setup. A lot of introduction to this new character. The creature, when he does show up, though, it's great. But then it ends, and it just leaves you wanting more. I'm a big fan of the Universal Monsters. This is written by Dan Waters and Rom V. It's got artwork by uh, Matthew Roberts and Steve, uh, Dave Stewart on the coloring. So I liked it. I enjoyed it. I just wish we would have went a little bit further in the first issue, but I really enjoyed the setup and I'm excited to see what happens there. The Six Fingers is here with issue number three. This is part of a detective crime murder story along with the book The One Hand, which is written by Rom V. This is written by Dan Waters. Rom V's One Hand is from the detective's point of view. This book is from the killer's point of view, but you get a little bit more clarity of what's actually happening as well as more mystery surrounding these events. But there are some big reveals. There are some interesting connections. I love Sumit Kumar's artwork here. I love the pace of this story. I love how it ties into the one hand. You can read each of these books individually and it will work, but they supremely work when you read them both together because they definitely play off of each other. But Six Fingers number three, very cool. Then we've got Feral, issue number two. Um, Feral is great. I've read the first three issues of this series. It's basically a zombie tale with cartoon cats, right? But there's a rabies outbreak going on, and humans are trying to round up all of the animals, and there are a few house cats that are loose out in the woods, and all of a sudden, all these rabid raccoons and dogs and other cats are attacking, and it works, and it works so well. It feels like 
Don Bluth by way of George A. Romero. The art is magnificent. You've got Trish Forstner doing all of the cats, all of the dogs, all of the animals, and the backgrounds are all done by Tone Rodriguez, which gives it this, ooh, that's a, that's a moment I don't want to share right there, but it gives us this really cool classic animated movie kind of vibe to it, and Tony Fleece is just playing the hell out of these zombie tropes and these characters and making it work and there's some real shocking and even sad moments here and a great homage cover to nightmare on elm street and if you like the homage horror movie covers like i do there's a second print of issue number one that's homaging halloween so we get two of the greatest slasher beginnings here with Halloween homage and Nightmare on Elm Street. That's freaking dope. Then we got Duke issue number five. This is the final issue of Duke, a very satisfying ending that sets the, uh, sets the trail to blaze forward into what is going to become the G.I. Joe teams, right? But it's a great action-packed conclusion that sets everything up very nice for where this series is going to go into the future. We got one more issue of Cobra Commander, both by Joshua Williamson. Then we got a Scarlet and a Destro series coming out. I've heard some of the plans for it from Kelly and Dan Waters, who are Kelly Thompson and Dan Waters, who are the writers of those series. And Josh Williamson ain't done. There's more on the way, and I'm very, very excited. The lack, or not the lack, but the the level of enthusiasm and excitement that comes across the page goes right into the reader's heart. And this is what good comics based on franchises and, main and for mainstream audiences, this is what they do when they do it well. Duke number five is awesome. I love it. Fantastic stuff. Then we got Dutch issue number three from Joe Casey, Simon Gain. I freaking love this book. So Dutch is a character from back in the Extreme Studios days. He was created by Chap Yape, so he's not part of all that young blood, murky legality stuff, right? So Joe Casey's able to kind of tell a story of what is it like when these extreme heroes from the 90s actually grow up. Now we see this kind of playing out in books like Local Man by uh, Tim Seeley and Tony Fleece. But it's a different thing here because it's not a made-up character. Dutch is definitely a part of that shared image universe from the 90s. And it's really cool seeing a Gran Torino-type story with Dutch in the modern day. And it's also setting up Blood Squad 7, which is basically extrapolating this concept out to Youngblood. But since Youngblood's not usable, it's Blood Squad 7. So there are different characters that fill the role of people from Youngblood. And Youngblood fans will be able to put it together. I've read the first two issues of Blood Squad 7. If you're liking Dutch, you're going to love that book. And it's really taking the core concept of Youngblood, which is about celebrity superheroes that are actually kind of a front for a black ops team as well. Um, it's taking that idea not only into today, but really fleshing that idea out more than it ever has been. So Dutch, number three, works on its own as its own series. Dutch, one, two, and three with the Zero issue that collects all the stuff from the 30th anniversary anthology. But you don't, you don't have to read Blood Squad 7 to, under, to appreciate this, right? Obviously, because it's not out yet. But I'm saying the whole point of this book is not just to launch Blood Squad 7, but it's a really great kind of final farewell of sorts for Dutch. I really liked it. Then we've got World Tree here with issue number nine. This was an eye issue. Um, when World Tree came back from its hiatus, it had a couple of boring issues. Then it had an issue that really knocked my socks off. This book has elements that knock my socks off and then other elements that just kind of feel boring, confusing, and a little unclear, right? A little obscure. But that being said, I've got a big rip in my comic that apparently I didn't notice until just now. There are some really cool moments here. I can't share them um, because they mostly involve a completely nude woman. Um, that one right there, that's pretty dope. What, what I can do? I can do something like that, right? Yeah, I can, I can do that. Really cool stuff, but at the same time, it's like half of it works. Half of it kind of just seems dull and boring. Definitely one that I need to sit down and reread all the issues together and see what happens. James Tynan can be like that sometimes. Here's his new one, Spectrograph, right? Spectrograph is a new distillery book from James Tynan IV, Christian Ward and Aditya Bidikar. It is a gorgeous book. Christian Ward is an amazing talent, a great artist. The colors being used are great. Aditya Bidikar's lettering is solid. The sense of design and composition work. The story's intriguing too. 
but it's not 100% clicking on all cylinders for me. It's about this woman. She is a realtor. She has to sell this expensive house to this person, but she forgets that she left her baby in the high chair alone. So she's worried about that. She gets to this house. There's something mystical and supernatural about it. She gets trapped there and all this kind of stuff. It's it's all right. Like the book is gorgeous. And as you're reading it, you get, you're into it. But there are certain elements where you're like, I don't know if that's really clicking for me. And then it gets to a really cool moment towards the end right there. Great colors, but the story doesn't fully come together. But it's intriguing enough that I will definitely check out the next issue. So I thought that was decent. Dick Tracy issue number one, that's from Mad Cave Studios. They're celebrating their 10th anniversary this year. And they've got a lot of big projects on the way, including some licenses like Dick Tracy. I was really into this book, right? So I became a fan of Dick Tracy because of the movie back in the day with Warren Beatty and the action figure line from Playmates that went along with it. Surely behind me somewhere I have a Dick Tracy action figure. Not anymore, I have moved it. Anyway, y'all have seen my Dick Tracy action figures. I love that stuff. So I was really excited to check this out. Now I've really never gotten the opportunity to go back and read all the Chester Gold stuff. There are these new hardcovers that are out, but they're like 60 bucks each, so I haven't gotten a chance to read them yet. Um, so I've never really read a lot of Dick Tracy comics. I read some of the newer ones that they did. There was one that uh, Michael Avon Oming was the penciler on and Mike Allred was the inker, I think, and that was really solid. But this Dick Tracy number one was really cool. First of all, it was way more intense than I thought it would be. It's bloody, it's violent, and it's slowly building up the world of Dick Tracy. It's all new. It's an introduction of Flat Top. It's the introduction of Dick Tracy. It's the introduction of Mumble. So even if you don't really know anything about these characters, or even if you're only familiar with the movie and the toys like I am, or even if you're probably the most longtime Dick Tracy fan, this is a really great start. And if you know nothing about Dick Tracy, just jump into here. It is violent. It is cool. The characters ring true. Um, the art is decent. Could be a little bit better artistically speaking, but overall, I had a lot of fun with this book. I really, really did, and it made me want to read the Chester Gold stuff for sure, and also rewatch that movie. I think that movie's great. Check out our PCP movie night we did a couple years ago on it. It's an underappreciated movie. It's kind of forgotten today. Slash presents Deathstalker issue number one. This is a new one from Vault, and this book was wild. It was really fun. Deathstalker, I think, is based on something, but I'm not 100% certain what it's based on. Cover up the boobies. The art's decent. It's all right. But Tim Seeley's script is incredibly funny. The art's solid. It's Jim Terry, Kurt Michael Russell on the uh, coloring. Um, but it's not taking itself very seriously. It's crude. It's rude. It's irreverent. Um... And it's just dumb. It's just big, dumb fun. Gigantic, moronic splendor. It kind of is in the same vein as something like Barbaric, but it does feel different than that. But it has that same kind of snarky attitude and cynical view to it. But Deathstalker was definitely entertaining. So if you like dick jokes and you like violence and you like crude, rude behavior, check out Deathstalker. Um, presented by Slash. Guns N' Roses fame. Then we got Dawn Runner, issue number two from Dark Horse Comics from Ron V and Evan Cagle. The first issue was all right. It's a mech story, right? But it didn't do much in the first issue to really differentiate itself from other mech stories like, say, Pacific Rim or Neon Genesis Evangelion to really make it feel like, what's the difference here? They get more into that difference in issue number two and it bolsters the concept up into interesting to completely engaging, enthralling, and intriguing, at least to me. There is an element to the human mech connection that I don't know if I've seen used before. I've seen parts of it used before, but not quite in this way, and I really was blown away by Evan Cagle's artwork on this series. A great sense of movement and scope and scale. I didn't think it was there in issue number one, but it definitely is here and alive and well in issue number two. So issue number two really elevates the concept and makes this book, to me, a must read. Also from Rom V, we got Rare Flavors, issue number five, the penultimate issue of Rare Flavors, and probably the weakest issue in a, of a source, but still a damn good comic. Felipe Andrade's uh, artwork is absolutely stunning. Once again, you get another 
uh, recipe that is tied in thematically to the story. This is a story that feels like an end. Also a lot of explanations of the origins of some of the characters in the book, but it's not the end because it's setting up the end. It's interesting how this is going to fit in structurally with the entire series. I have loved this book so much. I do think that some of the delays have kind of bogged it down just a little bit, but we got one more issue after this, and I'm really excited to see how Ram V and company are going to wrap this up because this book has been filled with resonance and nuance, detail, and humanity. Something I really, really like. All right, then we got Man's Best, issue number two. Um, love the artwork by Jesse Lonergan. The story is just kind of okay. It's about this ship that's leaving Earth, trying to find a new world for humans. There are these three emotional support animals in there, two dogs and a cat. They have these like mech suits or something like that. The ship gets the ship gets, does it wreck? The ship gets wrecked or something. The humans taken away and now it's up to the, the animals to try to find their way in this new alien world and find the humans and help them out. Um, I loved the art, but I never really felt super connected to the story in issue number two. And I did love issue number one, but number two was kind of wearing thin on me. And then we get to the end and I'm like, don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. Don't bore me this entire book. And then at the last pages, pull me right back in so that I got to come back for issue number three. But you know what? For that Lonergan artwork, it's definitely going to be worth it. Once Upon a Time at the End of the World, the penultimate issue, issue number 14, only one more left in the series that is about love at the end of the world. Love, how it breaks you apart, how it pulls you together, and how it causes regret, guilt, shame, remorse, but also how it actually builds something new. I know that sounds cheesy, but this is a really great book that's not very judgmental, but in a very realistic and brutally honest way, explores love and relationships and how we hurt those closest to us and how those closest to us hurt us, how we respond, how we deal with it, and how even the apocalypse wouldn't stop that from happening. But Once Upon a Time at the End of the World has been one of the best Jason Aaron books that I've read in a long time, though I love his Punisher, and I think he's kind of doing some solid stuff right now. But Once Upon a Time at the End of the World, number 14, loved it. Pine and Miramac issue number four is here, and it was pretty decent all the way through. Um, it's about this uh, husband-wife private detective team, and they have uncovered this, like, sex cult that's also part of the occult. And it's interesting, and it's got this nice humorous take to it, and it's got this nice, like, I don't know, it's got this nice, like, kind of vibe to it where it doesn't feel like it's taking itself too seriously and it's having fun with it, and then it takes a really dark turn. It takes a dark turn that I did not see coming. We'll see how they write themselves out of it, or if they don't, that's a bold move. It's a low blow, blah, blah, blah. You guys check out the blah, 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 law blog. Anyway, so I thought that was pretty good. Then we've got Conan the Barbarian, issue number 10. I'm loving this Conan book. Absolutely. Jim Zub knows what old school Conan fans want, but he also knows how to craft a great modern comic that's going to be pleasing to all fans today. I enjoy the hell out of this book. The book leans very heavy into its John Basima kind of inspiration but that works the the wordplay it's 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 everything you expect but a little bit different could cool. make sure i didn't go onto a page with boobs yeah that's the other thing it has boobs no but i love this one in this story conan's flung back into the past he's meeting cole they're going to atlantis it's just good classic conan fun and I'm all here for it. And then from Black Box Comics, we have Biomex issue number one. This is written by Jay Sandlin, who is actually a friend of mine. And I thought the book was all right. It's got some really solid artwork, but kind of, it's kind of just Transformers. It's kind of like Transformers. So it's the it's a world of just mechanical beings and creatures. They actually even change into vehicles. Um, and the world is being overrun by this other f force of robots called the Hive and they're taking people over and there's this mission to send these people back into the past to change things. So it's it starts Transformers, then it goes into a different direction. I found it decent enough. I thought it was all right. It definitely got to see where this story is going to go. Um, I have trust in Jay though. I think Jay's a solid writer. So I will definitely keep up with this one and see what happens. Also, friend of the show, member of the Excitable PCP crew, and one of our family here, Joe Corallo has released his first 
YA graphic novel. It's King Arthur and the Knights of Justice based on a, an animated series or something, I think, that I'm not familiar with. I have not read this yet, but this is from our buddy Joe Corallo. So I wanted to point out that it's out. I got a copy. I'll be reading it. Oh, it's got some nice embossing on the cover, too. Really cool stuff. So I'm really, really super proud of Joe. It looks great. I'm excited to dive in. Um, a take on the classic 90s animated hit. How did I miss up on this one? Like, I barely remember Cowboys of Mumesa. So maybe that's part of it, too. But anyway, King Arthur and the Knights of Justice are here from our buddy, Joe Corallo. To wrap up, Biomex is all right. A little bit of a Transformers ripoff, but it starts distinguishing itself. Conan just does what Conan does and does it well. Pine of Miramac takes a dark turn in a book I was not expecting it to. Once upon a time at the end of the world, a brutal story of love at the end of the world. Man's best was a little dull and then at the end really pulled it together. Rare flavors, penultimate issue, super solid. Very excited to see how it's going to fit in with the overall structure. Dawn Runner, issue number two. Kicks it into high gear and definitely makes that a must read. Death Stalker's just dumb, crude fun that I had a lot of fun with. Dick Tracy was a really graphically violent uh, take on Dick Tracy. A really cool reintroduction to that world. Spectrograph didn't nail everything, but the art nailed it all 100%. World Tree, half amazing, half kind of dull. We'll see what happens. Dutch, a great conclusion and a great setup for Blood Squad 7. Duke, a great ending and a great setup for what's to come in the world of the Energon universe. Feral, with some great homage covers and a great second issue. Zombies meets cats. Yeah, think of it that way. Six Fingers is really freaking good. Creature from the Black Lagoon didn't get uh, give me enough, but it gave me enough. Does that make sense? Drawing Blood has come out before, but if you missed it, definitely check it out. A fictional take on the life of Kevin Eastman. The Penguins continues to be mean-spirited and pretty awesome. Green Arrow, a little structurally interesting, but pretty fun book. The Challenging Flash, very confusing. Detective Comics soaring, nearing that end of his run. Batman Dark Age was awesome. Night Thrasher sucked. Blade was an abrupt ending. Didn't feel like they knew it was coming. Daredevil sucked. $10 for no reason. God's is all right. God's is all right. Ultimate Universe is out in second print. If you need that, get that. Ultimate Spider-Man number four, a little bit of a letdown, but still decent enough. Um, cover of the week, Darth Maul, black, white, and red. But the pick of the week in Mythologies and Apocrypha, issue number one from Fantagraphics. It also gets the smell of the week as well. So there you go. Really great book with old school pop culture icons kind of through that lens telling the story of who knows what. But really great artwork there. So that's what I read. That's what I thought. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at patreon.com slash PCP if you want to help support the channel. Thank you all for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station. Pop, pop. Boom!